have, I regret to say, only a very limited amount of time for uh, audience question and answers. Uh, I would ask the uh, expert witnesses who have testified today to kindly come forward to the to the front, um, and uh, or, or possibly uh, if if you're near the front, you can you can come forward when a question is directed to you. Do do come do come forward. Yes, I think that's better. Thank you, Barbara. It's if if the expert witnesses would would kindly uh, come to the front. Um, I, I should mention. Uh, that because our time is so short, uh, you remember that um, we ha we need absolutely to be out of the room before six o'clock, um, and and that means entirely cleared out. Um, members of the organizing committee have quite have kindly gone through the written questions that audience members have passed forward to us in order to reduce the degree of repetition and overlap. Ple please be assured that your questions will all be responded. We'll all receive responses. Um, we will answer as many as possible at, at this time now. First question to all witnesses who have active or recent academic positions, what is the extent and or depth of interest in your views of 9-11 by your academic colleagues? That's a question to all of the witnesses who have active or recent academic positions. Well, uh, very little. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I mean, it, uh, I, that's as much as I need to say. <laughs> speak from here. Yeah, yes, do, do speak from here, um, This is not on anymore. Oh. oh, is it on? Yes, it oh, is. Okay. <coughs> um, until, my, uh, <coughs> until my retirement from uh, the Naval Postgraduate School about July 1st. Um, for 15 years, I was the senior military affairs journalist there, but I w also participated in the academic world there. And uh, talk to me afterwards about individual incidents, but I'm just going to give you one example. For reasons that I do not understand, I do not, because I have been active, like Cynthia McKinney's been active, and Richard Gage and David Ray Griffin, as active in saying what I've said here today, and you saw the power of what I told you. I proved my case that the Pentagon was attacked from the inside with explosives, just like the World Trade Center on 9-11. I've been saying that ever since 9-11 while I was in a DOD job. As the chief journalist at the Naval Postgraduate School, the US government's premier science, technology, and national security affairs university. And I asked myself, this is a test. Are they going to let me in the gate? Every single day, I asked myself. And every day, they let me in the gate. So I won't go into why I think that is now, except I think that, well, I will. I believe that there are people very high up in the military who like what we are doing but don't feel that they can come forward without jeopardizing their positions, <coughs> like the gentleman who came from the military to Cynthia right after 9-11 and said this is being planned for at least 10 years. And yes, Cynthia, I have information that I will share with you that absolutely supports that especially the theft of the 2000 election also, directly linked to 9-11. So, and then I'll give you just one other example. I was supported, and I did just simply retire. However, and I did a very good job at my job. I mean, all my, my articles are still online, but I'm going to give you another example. This was just, this university has about 2,000 senior military officers down to usually mid-career military officers who are students in a graduate school. And one of them, then they go off to Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever they go. This one woman learned about my public speaking on 9-11 and I've published. And she came into my office very sheepily one day in her military uniform and she said, are you Barbara? And I said, yes. And she said, do you think maybe I could have one of your tapes and my, my DVDs? And I said, well, sure, I'll bring it in. So a couple of days later she came in, I gave it to her. I didn't expect her to give it back. I meant her to have it. Just before she was, she went off to Afghanistan, about two months later, she came into my office and she said, this was the DVD, she said, thank you very much for letting me have this, but I just haven't been able to watch it. Oh. Mm. Of course she watched it. <laughs> so there's a perfect example of this groupthink and this fear 
mentality, but I know for a fact that every single one of those individuals who are in the military, who have been exposed to the truth by myself and others, and I've been doing it from the inside of DOD now for 10 years, they really want to come over to our side, most of them. Thank you very much, Barbara. <laughs> Another question, and this I think could be answered by any of the panelists. Why has no one drawn attention to Building 6, which can be seen being destroyed by a huge explosion before the Twin Towers came down? Uh, building 6 was right uh, under uh, the towers, and it uh, suffered a whole lot of damage as a result of the falling debris. Um, there is a series of explosions which, um, which, which uh, emit a whole lot of, of, uh, of, of dust and so forth. The, the video is um, not clear as to whether that's coming from Building 6 or not. There's uh, arguments on both sides of this fence. Um, but there's a huge hole in the middle of Building 6. And... Um <coughs> Some believe that it was, uh, this is the Department of Treasury was in, in this building, and uh, there's a lot that was going on with that department <laughs> that uh, somebody may not have wanted exposed uh, also. So anyway, that's a, a lot of speculation uh, beyond that. Uh, thank you, thank so you, Richard. Into. Another question, if flight manifests don't show hijackers' names, why don't the airlines object to the government's <coughs> adding of them to their passenger lists? I, I want to make a comment about that. I, I saw in that Musawi trial, I think you've got to check this out, that actually one of those manifests had been released. I mean, check, check out. Be sure that you're right on that. Um, I, I, it doesn't mean a lot, but, uh, you know, we have to check it out. But I, I'm almost sure... I look sometimes at the 9-11 myths site to check out what they're saying and what evidence they got. I, I will tell you, I got on to this thing about the release of the, of the Sela document from looking at the 9-11 myths thing, but, it's, but it, it's right there in front of me. I mean, they found something that I hadn't seen, and, and I took account of it. So, you know, I don't know what else to say. Could you repeat that question or rephrase it? Or, yeah. uh, sorry, let me see if I've got it. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm sorry, here it is, Jay. If flight manifests don't show hijackers' names, why don't the airlines object to the government's adding of them to their passenger lists? I think that, okay. You wanna, go, go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm going to give this back to him, but really quickly. If I, if I recall correctly, the Congress couldn't vote fast enough to give a whole bunch of money to the airlines. It was, it was hush money. So this is tangential to that. There is uh, documented evidence. Hold it very close. OK, back. there's documented evidence. Uh, Boston Globe presented a, a copy of what they said was a, f a flight manifest. It came out in their news story, I believe, maybe o October 2006. And on this flight manifest, we're all all the hijackers' names in the final FBI list, except for one. That one's names on the flight manifest was, uh, let's see how I get this right, Abdul Rahman Alomari, the, the post-mortem guy that was, he, he you know, couldn't have been on the, l the second list. He turned himself in as still alive. And... It should have been the second one who uh, the, the FBI said was on their final. He, the second, the person who replaced Abdul Rahman Alamari was Abdul Aziz Alamari on the final list of 19. The guy that you saw in the Portland video along with, well, uh, Atta. So neither of them was, and the, the FBI still has refused to change their story. Thank you. Oh, Just a comment on my, my earlier comment. Um, it's important for people to know, and I meant to add it, that the, um, the Department of Defense's, the Pentagon's own autopsy report, states explicitly that there are 
no Ara there was no DNA, Arab DNA found in any of the remains from the official story, in other words, from Flight 77 passengers or in the building. Thank you. Uh, another question, how much money was made on the 9-11 puts uh, on the companies affected by 9-11? You don't mind if I come up here? No, no, no. Uh, actually, I'm glad that was asked because I was going to say it and I forgot to say it. My estimate is the maximum just on the puts is, is $30 million. The maximum on the puts is $30 million. Okay, it doesn't mean it could be less, but it's not more than that. And I'll repeat again that that doesn't depend upon the statistical theory or econometric procedures that I described. It depends upon just simple calculations of how, many op how much open interest was at the end of the day on September 10th and then how many how much executions took place before until October 22nd thank you this is a question I think for Jay Kolar how reliable are CCTV images with security stamps isn't it possible to modify the stamps I, I'm not a CCT technologist I don't I don't a CCTV uh, I, I think that it's it's not possible, but then you know if if you're working for an intelligence community, you probably have all those. Uh, the technology is really advanced. Um, I don't think it's possible to get into those uh, TV, uh, video cameras. Thank you. Is another question? Well, I just wanted to say I do think it is. Um, if it's if it's digital, you can change it. But the question is, do you have even higher technology to detect the changes? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another question, is there any public right to have 9-11 put investors identified? Investors who lost millions were publicly identified in the Madoff scandal. Um, somebody asked me about that uh, in, in during the break, and that gave me some thought about it. The Madoff scandal investors had lost money, they may have stepped forward and said, you know, you cost me $10 million, and therefore they gave permission for their name to come forward. We have the opposite case here. In other words, you, I think, I th it is, I'm, what I was trying to say is that the government knows the names, but that we are not entitled to, the, to that, that kind of private information. So the information is there in the government, if the, now you can correct me here, but if there was a, a legal proceedings with, with a subpoenaed evidence that the judge might decide that some of these names could be released, but it would probably be the judge's decision about which would remain private and which would be, come out in the public record. Thank you. This is a question for Barbara Honiger. Was testing conducted uh, of the Pentagon rubble to determine explosive residue? No. <laughs> that doesn't come as a surprise. <laughs> Another question? Not that we know of, no. no. Right, thank you. It, there's no mention of it at all in the ASCE report. And in fact, one of the reasons that the caveat at the beginning of the ASCE, American Society of Civil Engineers, Pentagon Performance Report on the damage and how the building stood up after the attacks of 9-11, um, the fact that, the, uh, that it says basically we, we don't stand by anything we say in our own report, I read that to you, Mm -hmm. The caveat at the beginning, the disclaimer. One of the reasons is, is that the ASCE investigators weren't allowed in until all the rubble was cleared, everything. And they came in and put gravel over the, what would have been the area that you could see if there was any damage right outside the building or on the lawn. Yeah, thanks. If anyone has critical information on 9-11 being an inside job, who should they report it to for it to be investigated? To the Mike Gravel yes. state <laughs> initiatives. Thank you. Here's a question, an online question for Jay Kolar. Have any of the living hijackers spoken lately in public? <laughs> well, no, and the reason why, if you want me to speculate about that, I will. Um, Certainly. The reason why is that 15 out of the 19 were Saudis. And you can probably picture the, the, the king of Saudi Arabia. Well, let's just put it this way. Saudi intelligence, Saudi covert operations are all run through the king. 
you know, the royal family owns it, the, the uh, GID, Government Directorate, and uh, th so there'd be no problem giving them new identities, uh, you know, or tucking them away somewhere. And the rest who came forward, uh, they had to be probably liquidated. As well, I'm, I'm saying such as uh, uh, Zia Jera, he had to be liquidated, but uh, I mean, he, he was definitely not alive. He's, he's, the one, he's the one case that goes against the grain. Um, but the answer is no, no one has done a public interview. No, you see, if people say, well, how can you say they were still alive after 9-11? Well, they were alive after 9-11. Uh, they were reported as such by all these major uh, news organizations. One of them, such as Walid al-Sheri, uh, who comes from a very prominent family called the Sekali al-Sheri. See, a lot of people say, oh, they had names that are very common, al-Sheri. That's like saying Jones in this country. But the Sekali al-Sheri name, the father, Mohammed, um, was he had, he had gotten contracts to do, con he was hev heavily into construction work through the S Bin Laden family. So, I mean, he's run, there's all kinds of ties. The, the Sekali uh, al-Sheri, the uncle of the two boys, Wal Walid and Wa'il, uh, was th the head of the armed forces for Saudi Arabia. Uh, all kinds of connections there. And then you have, um, well, the fact that Walid al-Sheri was still alive, he reported it. He went to the Moroccan embassy. He was a pilot for uh, Air Morocco, I believe. And, uh, and that was reported by David Bamford of BBC. And very unprecedented, BBC changed their story under pressure from political pressure, probably from the FBI. Thank you, Jay. A que an online question for Michelle Chosodowski. Does installing LIFG in Tripoli act as a NATO UN endorsement of Al Qaeda? <laughs> well, the answer to that is no, because, uh, sorry, you can sit here. Well, be careful with the, uh, yeah. no, the, the answer to that is, is no, they're not, they can't endorse terrorism because they, and they deny the existence of, of the LIFG despite the fact it's on their records. I mean, I went to the United Nations, uh, Security Council website, and I checked, and it's still there. They've reclassified, so that the original uh, um, link that I got uh, in April is uh, came down in June, and I think actually it's still up there. But it, it the LIFG is still classified as a terrorist organization, and what they what they say is that these people are former terrorists. They cannot themselves endorse terrorism. That would be a non sequitur. But we can certainly uh, <laughs> underscore the fact that they are, in actuality, uh, endorsing these organizations and using them to invade and occupy a sovereign country. Thank you very much. Uh, an online question for Richard Gage. What do you think of alternate theories of the destruction of the World Trade Center, like mini-nukes and DEU, DEW, uh, the Directed Energy Weapons, I believe that stands for? There's a number of uh, theories out there, and um, what you want to do when examining these is test them against the scientific method. Uh, is the theory supported by the evidence? You saw the evidence today for the explosive destruction of these towers. Explosive destruction uses explosives. One of these theories, the DEW theory, directed energy weapons promoted by uh, Judy Wood is uh, denies the explosions that that uh, we've documented here. Uh, they deny the evidence of uh, the molten metal, iron, previously molten iron <laughs> microspheres in the World Trade Center dust, uh, and denies the uh, existence even of the high-tech nanothermite composite explosives that you're going to learn about tomorrow that exists in all the dust. So when uh, somebody comes forward with a theory that denies all the evidence that we know to be really quite solid forensic science-based evidence, I don't have much faith in that theory. And uh, <coughs> in the case of the, the mini-nukes theory, uh, there's been a number of 
nuclear physicists who have said there's not a signature that, uh, uh, of uh, radiation and so forth that's supported, that supports the hypothesis of the destruction of these buildings by smaller nuclear weapons. Well, they say, oh, no, this are, these are fourth generation nukes. They don't leave radiation. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's talk about aliens, you know. <laughs> we, we just don't have a, a way to go forward uh, based on rational discourse with some of these theories. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, we have an online could, question. Could I just add Actually, one sentence? B b There's a difference oh. between ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. Oh. There's no evidence of ionizing radiation. Okay, thank you. Uh, an online question. 85 security cameras, uh, c camera footage from 85 security cameras not released, would those cameras show the front of the Pentagon? I suppose that must be for you, Barbara. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. I, 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 let me repeat back the question to make sure I understand it. Uh, the question, the it's, it's a little bit uh, cryptic, uh, but I think, it, I think the meaning is uh, the, the footage from 85 security cameras not released, would, would that footage have shown the front of the Pentagon? Well, the question or shows a misunderstanding. The, the Pentagon has five fronts. <laughs> so I think the question means, <laughs> I think, the, and a top and a bottom. I think uh, it must mean the side that I was I think hit. it means the west face, technically the southwest face. Uh, well, uh, the, the only ones that matter um, are the ones that they would have, they, the ones that they confiscated are the only ones that would have shown anything about the alleged impact point and damage at the Pentagon, which would have been, yes, the west face. However, remember in my talk, and please come up to me and give me your email address and I will send you my whole PowerPoint because I only was able to do half of my talk, okay? I want everyone to have it. Um, however, uh, in my talk that I did get to, I did analyze those 85 tapes or give you the information from the FBI's own FOIA officer and uh, the other 83 show nothing to do with any possibility of an impact according to the FBI's own analysis. Only the two that were released in the Masawi trial, of which one of the two is the five famous frames, of which there's only one of the five frames that's an explosion, which does not show an impact of any kind, let alone a plane, and could easily have been the result of an impact at the building or inside. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have two more questions. I think we can hope to get through these two. Isn't it true that April Gallup's lawsuit against Cheney, Rumsfeld, and former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Richard Myers, was dismissed by Judge John M. Walker of the Second Circuit of the United States Court of Appeals, a cousin of George W. Bush. Well, Bush. they voted against her, yes. They, but she's considering an appeal, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. Go to, oh, what's the name of uh, Bill Veal's website? Do you remember? Well, anyway, see me afterwards. I'll give you, uh, her, her attorney is William Veal, whom I know. Uh, of the East uh, Bay in California, not far from where I live. And in fact, uh, I got them together uh, after I did my under oath to our videotaped interview of April Gallup and gave it to her attorney. My understanding is, and it's all on the website, including all of the documents from both sides of the case, um, it was at the second level uh, rejected by, I believe it was a three-judge panel, the deciding vote of which was uh, was an uncle, I believe, of George W. Bush. Uh, but they're considering an appeal. I don't know if they've done it or they're going to do it. I haven't gone there for a while. Thank you very much. And a last question, um, and I'll, I'll ask for a very brief answer. Uh, this is for Professor Chosodovsky. Did ISI's transfer of $100,000 to Mohammed Atta uh, w it wasn't intended, I think the intention of, this, of the question is, to later frame Pakistan? I'm a little puzzled by the question. But can you answer that? Well, I, I don't know whether uh, that particular event was to frame Pakistan. I don't think so, but certainly Pakistan has been framed. Okay, mm -hmm. That's for sure. And uh, I think that that transition came uh, uh, with the uh, assassination of Benadir Bhutto and the transition to a so-called civilian government. It was the end of an era uh, of military dictators and, and it led into a new relationship and a new kind of, uh, it was a regime change in essence and it, it is uh, a de facto uh, invasion of that country because uh, milit in fact they control the airspace, they have, they're attacking uh, uh, territories within Pakistan, 
And it, it, I think uh, Pakistan, yes, was framed into the broader AFPAC war using the, the, the war on terrorism as a pretext to wage a war on, on a country which is Pakistan, a, a large country of, of 130, 40 million people. Now, uh, and, and uh, again, uh, what this underscores is the fact that the ISI was um, complicit with, uh, with the CIA in supporting the ter terrorists covertly. Uh, and now what is happening is that the United States is, uh, is dwelling upon the Pakistani support to the terrorists, which they did on behalf of the United States, but which now uh, is considered as, as to be a crime of lese majesté, which then gives the pretext to invade them when in Sa fact they were working with them. Okay. Sa thank you, thank you, Michelle. I'm sorry to be, sorry to be cutting off what I, uh, a response which I would love to hear more of. But we, we now uh, need to uh, close today's session.